Church, I want to tell you today that the King of Kings and Lord of Lords is here. And that you just didn't walk into a church building today. But you walked into a family that believes in the author of the universe. You walked into a family that believes that God is sovereign. And he's omniscient, which means he knows all. And so whatever you came in here worried about, Whatever you came in here anxious about, you can find rest here. Because in this place, we give God room for him to move and not our man-made motives and not our wisdom, but his kingdom and his kingdom principles. Amen. Last week, Pastor Josh spoke about what the kingdom truly is, and he said it was made up of three things. It is made up of a culture that believes in discipleship. Everybody say discipleship. But it's not a culture that just believes in discipleship, because a culture that only believes in discipleship and only thinking about the people are, are here becomes a culture that is stagnant. And a church that isn't stagnant is a church that believes in discipleship, but also it believes in going out into the world and proclaiming the gospel through evangelism. That means in our jobs, at the coffee shops, in the everyday way that we use our life, we will not be silent about a God who is King of kings and Lord of lords and who reigns in our life and that we are a light to the world, a salt to the earth to share this good news that you can be brought into the family of discipleship that follows a Jesus who wants to have an intimate relationship with you. So we have discipleship. We have evangelism and then we are called to be naturally supernatural amen because if we just have discipleship we're stagnant if we just have evangelism and not the and, and not discipleship we are hollow but the next portion that he, he added to it, it says that we need to be naturally supernatural that means that beyond what we can see that there is a spiritual world that we are connected to and God has given us through the power of his Holy Spirit, the fruits through out of relationship, love, joy, peace, uh, kindness, long-suffering, diligence. You guys know him, self-control. You find these in Galatians uh, 25, or Galatians 5, 24 through 25. It's called the fruits of the Spirit. We don't strive for the fruits of the Spirit. The fruits of the Spirit is, comes from our relationship with Christ. Amen? So the more intimate we are with Christ, the more peace we have, the more joy we have. You guys got me. But the other thing the Spirit gives to us are the, the gifts of the Spirit. And we're not a church that's striving for gifts or we're seeking out for gifts. It's just simply whatever the Holy Spirit wants to do, whether that be healing, whether that be miracles, whether that be an abundance of faith, whether that be a discernment of spirits, whether that be speaking in a tongue that you're not native to, whether it be an interpretation of tongues, we are a church that believes in nat being naturally supernatural. That means that our ways are not of this world. We are of the kingdom of God, and we are called to be supernatural people, but we're not called just to be supernatural people, right? Because we need discipleship and we need evangelism, amen? Because when we're just naturally supernatural and we don't have discipleship and we don't have evangelism he says we're just we just become what strange and we need to understand that we are god who brings all of them together and when all of them are brought together it's called his kingdom and so when you come in here, you're coming into his kingdom, into a church that believes in discipleship, which simply means to follow the ways of Jesus. We believe in a church of not closing our mouths, but speaking to a world of darkness and being a light to it and having holy boldness and intimacy enough to not be ashamed of who he is and proclaiming his name and saying, yes, I am a Christ follower. Therefore, I don't act this way and I don't do these things. I'm set apart for his goodness in his way, and I am naturally supernatural, which means that there are gonna be some ways in how I operate that's gonna be different from the world, and you may think that that's weird, but that's okay, because it works. And it's sometimes the most loving thing we can do. That's the kingdom. That's what we're in today, amen? Amen. amen. So, I prayed this prayer before we came in here that God just gives us a supernatural ability to be bold and a supernatural ability to understand intimacy with him. You, oftentimes we're not bold in our faith is because we have no intimacy. 
Our trust becomes in, I don't want to seem weird. I don't want to be that, that Christian. I don't want to be that person. And I don't want to rub people the wrong way. And then we get fearful of saying certain things that God has asked us to say. Because we don't want to come across as weird. But when we have intimacy, okay, perfect. But when we have intimacy with God, we only need validation from him. We don't need validation from people. We're called to love people. We're called to sacrifice our life for people. But it comes from an intimacy with God. And so my prayer today as a pastor is that we continue to be a church that has intimacy. This is why we open up the word of God. Because the word is God, right? I'm reading the scripture not for us just to say we open up the Bible to read, but I want us to think these are the intimate words and character of God for us to have an intimacy so we can be the kingdom, be the kingdom of priests and kings to speak about the good news of the kingdom of God and who he is to us and be bold about it. If we knew that our brothers, our sisters really would die and go to hell without knowing about this gospel, how bold would we be to speak to them? Would you rather your brother go to hell and you be afraid of being seen as a, uh, because you're afraid of being a weirdo? Or would you rather say, Lord, at the end of I did my best to love people and how you called me to love them. The Bible talks about how we are called to go and to save our brothers and sisters as the hands and feet of Christ. That's the opportunity we get today. That's why we read the scripture. So with our hearts and minds on that, let's pray. Father, we ask that our hearts be open and we open up our hearts to you. We open up our minds to what your word has to say. As we're going through 1 Corinthians and, you're, and Paul is speaking to the church in Corinth, we ask that we can understand the context and how it's applied in that culture and how that relates to us today. Give us your wisdom and not our own. Today we exchange our hearts for yours and we delight ourselves in you. In Jesus' name, we all said, amen, amen. First Corinthians, verse 18. We're going through 18 through 31. So we got a couple verses to read, but everybody say, I'm with you, Pastor. Thank you, I'm so happy. Let's prove the statistics wrong and say you guys have an attention span longer than 20 minutes, all right? All right, verse 18. This is Paul speaking to the church in Corinth. A church that had been divided. A church that had been arguing. A church that was highly sexually immoral. And a church that had its wisdom in men and not in God. Had its wisdom in philosophers and priests who had no connection with God. And not in the one Yahweh, King of kings and Lord of lords. So this is what Paul has to say to that culture that is being divided, that has not put their trust in him. He says, for the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written in Isaiah, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom. Some would say worldly wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews 
and folly to Gentiles, but to, do, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, get that, but those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men. The foolishness of God is wiser than all the men on this earth. And the weakness of God is stronger than all the men on this earth. And so because of this, for consider your calling, which you have been called out of, brothers. Not many of you were wise, even according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. I want to talk to you guys about a God who comes down the mountain. This may be strange verbiage for many of you, but if you think of the picture as you're talking to a Greco-Roman society or a Greek society that's mixed with mythology, in mythology you have Zeus and you have Athena and you have Mars and you have, and you have these, all these gods and they sit on a mountain and this mountain is called Mount Olympus. Who's all seen Hercules and Disney? I have often dreamed of a far off place. Favorite Disney movie. Don't, don't hate me. I understand it's pagan worship. I'm not looking at it that way. But in that movie you see that these gods sit on a mountain and the people below, they sit and they have to serve and guess what these gods want. And these people sacrifice to these gods. And they live their lives in fear of these gods. And these people are, are at complete mercy of these gods and of their ways. And so for people who believe in Poseidon, they do uh, rituals and sacrifices that are to the god of the sea. And for people who do rituals, which were real things that were happening in Corinth, by the way. And so, so for people who believed in Zeus, this god who's the god of the sky and the earth, they would do certain sacrifices and, and ways and they would have to play guesswork for this God who's up in the sky, right? And for the God of Eros or the God of, who is God of the erotic nature, they would do these certain temple uh, acts and acts of sexual immorality to try to please this God who is far up in the sky, who's on this mountain. And many pagan, all, all actual religions have this concept of their God who's on the top of the mountain and we have to then subject Project ourselves to this God and in order for us to truly be loved by these gods we have to figure out the way to climb up the mountain to please them it's about all the works that we can do it's about all the things that we can do to please these gods nothing about how they can please us but what we have to do to please them but then there comes a God Yahweh and he sits in the true heavenly places and he is king of kings and lord of lords. And he loved us so much that while he was, the Trinity was in the heavenly place, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, our God came from the heavens, came down the mountain onto the earth to live like you and I. To endure the struggles and the troubles that we have as you and I. To be tempted in every fashion and setting aside his deity power and to endure every struggle that you have, we have. The Bible says that Jesus was tempted in every single fashion just as you, but yet he was without sin. And the God of our universe, 
Yahweh came down the mountain to live, but not only did he live and overcome sin, he came and died as a pure and spotless sacrifice, and he exchanged his perfect life that was without sin, he exchanged his life for ours. Not because we were worthy, and not because we were sacrificing like they sacrificed the Zeus, but because he loved us and he thought that you were worth it. Our God came down the mountain. And so Paul is speaking to a culture that did not understand this concept of people who would preach about a Messiah from Nazareth who was a carpenter's son and a carpenter himself and that this Messiah and this God would be spit on and then crucified on the cross, which was the worst death that could die. And that a people would believe in this Messiah and put their faith and strength and understanding in a God who would go and die on a tree. To them, that seemed foolish. To the Gentiles, or to the people who believed in pagan rituals and pagan worship, that didn't make sense to their wisdom, to gods who had all authority, all wisdom, who were all powerful, who were untouchable, and we were subject to them. But they see a God who allowed himself to be subject to us. That was foolish. And it says that the Jews would seek for a sign, right? And it says that the Gentiles would seek wisdom. When we look back in the Bible and we see the Jews who sought after a sign, how many signs did Jesus show them? Lame men walking, blind men seeing, but yet they still ask, show us a sign, show us a sign. Show us a sign. And it was actually in their blood, it was in their history, that even when Yahweh was interacting with the Jewish people, the people of Israel in the desert, and he would put a pillar of fire by night and a cloud by day, a huge cloud, a whirlwind that would show them where they're going, give them direction. And even when he would allow bread to fall from heaven, with all those signs, they still were what? Hard-headed. It's not about the signs. But then we also see with the men of wisdom throughout history. And Daniel shows us a picture that all these wise men who were in King Nebuchadnezzar's council, he has a dream and none of these wise men who he brought from all over the different corners of the known world to be wise and in wisdom and men who studied the stars and men who studied potions and all of these things could yet not give answers. But Daniel, who said, let me go and pray to my God and he will answer me, and then gives a perfect interpretation to this king of what his dreams was and what was going on. Still, in that time, the next king, knowing that Daniel was this man, he still was also hard-headed with all of that wisdom, intellectual wisdom. And we see here that Paul is speaking to a culture who's saying there's nothing new under the sun. And still today, there's nothing new under the sun. Many of us today are asking for signs and spiritual signs to believe in the folly of the Christ, uh, of fo the, folly, the folly of the cross. Many of us are reading books and going on YouTube and figuring out an uh, intellectual way to ascend into heaven, yet are still found stumbling, hurting, and with no answers, even in the age of information. Why? Could it be because we cannot just simply put our trust in the God who came down the mountain in the form of Jesus Christ and understanding the life that Jesus lived 
and understanding that the life that he lived and the life that he died and the life that he resurrected is the one simple truth that we can become like Paul. And the only thing I want to know is Christ and him crucified. The one thing I will live, the blueprint of my life is Christ and him crucified. So let's reflect for a moment. In this posture that Paul was speaking to a culture who was always looking for a sign, always looking for a different Messiah other than the Messiah of Jesus, always looking for wisdom, what is keeping you from believing and pursuing Christ and Christ crucified? You can close your eyes. <laughs> Think about it. Let's not just read the word. Let's experience the word of God. Let us put ourselves in the place of the people who are in the city of Corinth, who have put their trust in the wisdom of men and the sensual acts of sexual and moral things, the things that make them feel good. And the categories in, cult, in the culture of I represent myself with this portion of culture, I represent myself with this portion of culture, and I put my trust in the Democratic Party, I put my trust in the Republican Party. What keeps us from pursuing Christ and the ways of Christ? And Christ crucified. What are our worldly signs, worldly signs, and wisdom today that we believe are bringing us to walk in freedom and purpose? Where are you finding your purpose? Are you finding your purpose in your job? In your children? In your nuclear family? In that house that you so desperately want? In that car that you so desperately want? In that credit score that, you, that so much represents who you are? In that girl or that guy? Where have we been the Jews and the Gentiles of the day where we ask for signs and wisdom that are not of the kingdom of God? And it's important that we as Christians do not bypass this moment simply because we believe in Christ, but don't address the things and the ways of our life that doesn't align with that belief. When God asks you to be faithful with one thing, but you won't because you think it'll take away from this thing. When God says that you're called to be a people who lay down your life in sacrifice and service to be a light, but yet we don't cut out any time in pursuit of our own goals, our own signs, and our own wisdom. When our worth is found in what even we can do for people more so than what God has asked us to do. First with him, and then, my, then out of the abundance of that, then what we can do for people. I take your silence as a moment of reflection. In verse 24, he says, but to those who are called, which is us, to those who are called, and our sin and our filth 
His love and kindness drew us to him. But it didn't just draw us to him. After we were able to come before the kings of kings and Lord of lords, he called to us and said, come. Come out of the world. Come out of the world of darkness and come into my marvelous light. Come and abide in me in the shadow of the Almighty. Did you know that God has called you? Not because of your perfection and not because of your works, but it was because he thought that you were worth it. That God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whomsoever believes in him will not perish. And he's saying that he loved you, that he gave his son, his pure, the spotless lamb he gave to you. And he used that as a calling that I believe in you and the purpose that I put in you so much. And even how even when it has been tainted by the ways that you've lived your life and what you have done, if you would repent and turn to me, all you would see and hear is me calling. Calling you unto me. But to those who are called, to us who are called, can you hear him calling your name? Can you hear him asking you to come closer to you? Can you hear him longing for you? As you're longing for every other sign, as you're longing for every other wisdom, can you be silent enough to hear him simply calling for you and asking you to rest and abide in him? But for those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, and what he is saying, it doesn't matter whether you're a Jew, whether you're a Greek, because in the kingdom there is neither slave nor free. Jew or Greek, slave or master. For those who are in the kingdom, which means that he is calling everyone. He has enough capacity for everyone. He has enough calling for everyone. He has enough purpose for everyone, Jew or Gentile. He said, for those who have called and have answered, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. That means for you. Paul says, the one thing I desire is to understand in my life and not only understand, not just to have the knowledge of it, but to understand it, for it to be working in my life, for it to be an active wisdom that I walk out is for me to understand Christ and him crucified. And this is what he was meaning. He says, because Christ is the very demonstration of God's power and Christ is the very demonstration of God's wisdom on earth. And so when Paul is saying to know Christ and to know Christ crucified, he says, for me to understand that is for me to walk in the true power of God and the true wisdom of God. For me to walk in the fullness of the counsel of God and his authority. That's what he means for us who are called to walk in this. Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Of God, do we believe in his power and his wisdom and that he has given to that to us? Amen. Now, let me ask you this. Do our actions align with it? Or do our actions align with the signs and the wisdoms that we're seeking and the purpose that we've established in our hearts instead of the purpose that God has established in his heart for us that he wants to give us? I know I haven't been perfect at that. I literally have to renew my mind daily. The, me, the pastor of Intersection Church, if I don't renew my mind daily in days that it happens, I get lustful, I get prideful, I get arrogant, I get defensive, I get weary, I get insecure. All of those things happen to me in real time if I don't renew my mind in Christ. If I don't understand Christ and Christ crucified every day, it doesn't give me the empowerment that I need to walk in power and authority because I become vulnerable and sensitive to the prince of the power of the air, which is Satan and the kingdom of darkness. And he gets to form me more than my mind being formed by Christ because of me renewing it. Because no one is above that. No one is above being formed by Satan in the kingdom of darkness. No one, regardless of what title you have, no matter of who you are. We have to renew our minds daily if we want to walk in the authority and the power of Christ. This is why the Bible talks about so much of people being faithful. 
He doesn't say just be faithful at the beginning of when you first come to Christ. Be faithful to the end. The Bible actually says that in the last days, he says the love of Christians, the love of believers, the love of churchgoers is going to then wax cold for one another. And there's going to be division in the church. Why? Because our minds aren't being renewed daily. He's saying not even the church is above need, needing to be renewed daily and understanding Christ and Christ crucified. Understanding that you have been called and he's called you to him and he's calling you to him each and every day. And what you find each and every day is the new mercies that you needed to overcome your insecurity. It's the new mercies that you need to overcome the things that make you arrogant. The new mercy that helps you to overcome those lustful patterns in your life. Those new mercies and grace that empowers you not just to say I need a mercy, but the grace that empowers you to teach you to overcome every day. And when the enemy comes knocking at your door with temptation, Jesus gives you the blueprint on how to overcome it because the Bible says that Jesus endured every temptation temptation yet he was without sin and Jesus says give me your life I give you mine and what comes with my life in a renewed mind in Christ he says you get the blueprint on how to overcome that's from young to old every day he's giving us the blueprint on how we can overcome we must consider our calling. What does it mean for us to understand what it means to walk in the kingdom of God? Don't wait for me to, to, to answer that for you. What does it mean for you to walk in the kingdom? What does it mean for you to accept the calling? We were at our men's retreat this past weekend was a beautiful time. A beautiful time. And what I saw in that time is just different men from different walks of life but connected through needing Jesus. And each and every one of them have different callings. Some called to be teachers. Some called to be pastors. Some called to be prophetic. Some called to be apostolic. Because these are the ministries and how the kingdom is built and equipped. It's not just about those titles, but it's about the function. Some men, welders. Some men, carpenters. Some men, pastors. Some men, accountants. But all of them have a role to play in the kingdom. What does it look like in here for us to be a church that everyone accepts that role? Stop living in false humility. Stop living in a way that I don't know what God can see in me. I don't know why God would love me. Stop living in a way. I have to speak myself in this way. Stop living as if you have no gifts when God says that he's given us all gifts and a purpose for his kingdom. It's folly for you to think that you can understand your purpose. That you can understand your gifting. That you know your call. And because you know it so much, you're afraid to open up your hands to him. Because you're afraid about what he may take away from you. Paul is speaking to a church in Corinth. Where he's saying, stop looking for how men look at life around you. And remember the cross. That many of you, it wasn't about your wisdom of what brought you to Christ. It wasn't about your nobility as what brought you to Christ. It was Christ and him crucified. Do you know who he was talking to? 
ex-prostitutes, homeless people, people who were not of noble birth, as it says in the scripture. He said, but yet then God uses you as a temple for the most high God, for the holy of holies to, res to rest and reside in you. And the world would think that that's foolish. And you think sometimes that that's foolish, that a God of the universe would choose to reside in you. But he says that is the power of the cross. That is why God can take a little boy's lunch and feed 5,000. That is why God can take a woman with an issue of blood and heal her. That's why God can take a, raise a little girl from death to life. That is why God can use 12 men, many of them unlearned, to turn the world upside down and bring his kingdom. Stop disregarding yourself and allow yourself to be a temple. Allow yourself to be a place where God gets to reside in you. And the holy of holies, it wants to rest in you. The Holy Spirit wants to rest in you. Stop looking to the world for your purpose. Stop looking for signs for purpose and allow yourself to just simply receive that the Lord has prepared me to be a temple. What's the Lord prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, and with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary, Lord, for you. Do you know that? Think about where that hymn came from. It came from this scripture. That is foolish that God will use us as a temple. He says that, that in th he says, I'm going to destroy this earthly temple. But in three days, I'm going to raise it back up. But it's not going to be raised up how you think it is. When this earthly temple is destroyed, I'm going to raise it up within my people. And what once used to be one physical temple, now my people are going to be temples all over that host my holiness, that host my glory. And he said, will you allow me to show my glory through your life? Will you allow me to show my holiness through your life? Will you delight yourself in the Lord, as Psalm 37 says? And he says, and he will make you a light unto the world. And he says that he will give you, he says that he will lend to you generously. This is what Psalm 37 says. He says that he will lend to you generously and more generously and generously so that my children will be a blessing. Think about that. Paul is saying, do not look at for the ways of the world for you to find your purpose. He said, but understand that there is a God when you come to him and you delight your life in him through prayer and reading his word and coming into a community of church and believers. He says, when you delight yourself in him, he's going to lend to you generously. Why? So that his children will be known as a blessing. He gives to us generously so that we can be a blessing, not for us to withhold it, so that we may be a blessing amongst all of the earth. He speaks, Paul is speaking to this church. He says, remember that God is using you to be the blessing in Corinth, not to be the one that causes Corinth to be more divided. That he's giving you a personal bema. In Corinth, there was this thing called a bema, and it was set up in, the, in, the, in like the courtyard area. And this is when people would have a, a, the good news report to say from the empire, from the emperor, that they would stand and they would declare what the emperor is saying to the people. Or if a great philosopher would come, and it was just like if you were to watch a great debate or something, it was called this bema, where they would stand and people, would, all thousands of people would come and they would stand and they would stand on this be, uh, bema and they would exhort or speak to the people and teach the people. And everyone from Corinth would go and speak and Paul is saying to them you don't need a bema in order for you to talk to the people you don't need a platform in order to talk to the people he says but I've given you a personal bema I've given you a personal temple for you to share my good news and for you to learn how to trust in me do not be like the men of Corinth and fall into their folly but follow the folliness of the cross be foolish and faithful to what the cross has said for you to do in your life What has the cross asked you to do in your life that you're afraid to give to him? I can't answer that, and I don't know the answers for every person here, but the Holy Spirit does. 
and he's knocking on the door of your life. There's plenty of college, we are, I think we got a lot of guests, uh, uh, college students, uh, John, can you stand up for a second? Can you, can you have the people stand up that you invited today? See some, of, see, some of you, he's used his life as a personal temple in Bama. To where he's starting a Bible study for people to learn the word of God so they don't have to trust in what man says for who they are as they're going and they're learning in their school and waiting for professors to tell them who they are and how they need to think and get wisdom from that. He's creating a space of holiness on his, cam on his campus for people to be, to be able to break free from the change of culture and to be able to walk in kingdom culture. John, I thank you for you being bold and inviting your friends. And I thank you for receiving the call that God will use just you. How many of you are there today? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Is that ten of you? I don't know if I count it right. Anyways, God's used less to change cities. He can use every single one of you to change your campus. Be bold and be holy. Being bold and being holy doesn't mean that you always live in the perfection, but it means that you live perfected by Christ. And it means that your hearts and your minds are always directed towards him. That means that you live different. When you get boyfriends and when you get girlfriends, live in an honorable way to where people can say they're doing it right. And there's a reason why. And you can say it's because of Jesus. We want to honor him with our lives. When you speak and people become de are debating about this or that, talk to them about the kingdom of God, about a Jesus who can came and that even when he was being led to the slaughter it says that he was like a sheep quiet led to the slaughter but but yet with full of all authority on heaven and earth and what he did is that he sacrificed his life for others and God is also calling you guys to sacrifice your life for others that are on your campus this is such a great call and God's going to give you strength and boldness and new mercies every day for you to live out that purpose and for you to live out that call thank you so much for coming today John thank you so much you may be seated. He didn't need a title. He didn't need to ask the pastor. He didn't need anything. All he needed was the good news to say, I want to invite you to, into a space where God is moving. And that's not me trying to be prideful, but I believe and I know that God is moving in his church. I hear testimony after testimony. And it's not because of, it's not because of me, but it's because of Christ that's in me. It's the Christ that's in us. It's what allows this culture and what allows this church to be set apart and different from all the ways of this earth. If you need refuge, you can find it here. Why? Because he's here. I will get out his way. For those who are called, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. For John, that was just an invitation to this church. And what he gets now is to see the fruit of the power and the wisdom of God because of an invitation. If he said, I'm gonna give you an invitation to a God that's gonna change your life forever, and someone would go, yeah, right. Remember that you are the temple and there was a moment in this, and, and, and there was a moment in time where there was a place that was so holy if men used to walk into it that they would die if they weren't covered or if they were not sinless. I want you to think about this. And when Jesus died on the cross, and when he was crucified, his blood is what covers us for us to always now be called the temple in the Holy of Holies, the Holy Spirit to rest in us at all times. So that means that we can have reverence for at any moment in time, at any one decision, that we bring people into the holies of holies because we are the temple of God and he rests and resides in us. And when we open up our mouths, they're getting an experience with the God of the universe. When we act as his hands and feet, they're getting an experience with the God of the universe. What a call. It may seem foolish to us, but God says he's going to use the foolish things to confound the wise. I know it seems foolish that God will use you. I know it seems foolish with all the baggage that you felt as though that you've had in your life that he would use you in such a way like that but he says let me use you and I will use the foolish things to confound the wise
Let's sing this. To be a saint, you have. Let us all stand. Pure and holy. Tried and true. Lord, we thank you for what you did today. We thank you just for your presence. We thank you for your word. We thank you for community. We thank you that you are gracing us to walk in purpose, that we're embarking on that journey with you, God, to do the things that you have called us to do, that we would be the effective kingdom witnesses that you want us to be in these last days. I pray your blood cover us, that you would keep us, that you would continue to wash us, cleanse us, and sanctify us, sanctify us as we grow close to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You are now dismissed.